Thank you all for coming this evening. My name is Ian Schneider. I'm a nurse practitioner. I work on the study. I think I've met almost every single person who was in, well, everyone was invited, but everyone who's been in the study. And it's, it's really thrilling to see so many people come here tonight to learn about what's been going on with uh, this research study that you all have put in so much energy into. So thank you for being here. Um, you all probably remember being really excited about the Biojector 2000, <laughs> and then after getting that first shot, being like, I hate that thing! <laughs> and then when we'd walk in to the, to the room the first time with that little, bla that little basket of tubes, and you'd think, oh look, how cute, they, just, they bought a bunch of extras, and then you'd realize that all of those tubes were for you. Uh, here's my agenda. Um, so we have a couple different people who are going to speak to you tonight um, and tell you a little bit more about the HBTN 505, so HIV Vaccine Trials Network Protocol Number 505, which is the study that you participating in, participated in. Um, and Dr. Darpin Sachdev is going to talk a little bit about the vaccine results and why the vaccine didn't work. Then we're going to have Dr. Susan Bookbinder, who's the director of Bridge HIV, talk a little bit about uh, the field of HIV vaccine science and where the field is going from here. Uh, then we're going to have Montika talk a little bit about uh, VISP, or vaccine-induced seropositivity, and this is where people who receive the vaccine actually test antibody positive on standard HIV tests and why it's important to continue testing with us here. And she'll actually show you a couple different, uh, couple different um, test results just to explain a little bit about, more about what that looks like. And then we're going to have uh, a little interactive activity where we have a race around the room to show about why it's so important for everyone to continue in the study as long as you're able. And to finish up, we have a small activity that we hope you'll help us with, and that's just to talk a little bit about retention and see if there's anything that you all can think about or think of that would make it easier for you to continue your participation in the study since we know that four years is a really long time. So with that, I'm going to use the computer this time. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Darpin Sachdev. Um, she is our HIV vaccine fellow here at Bridge HIV and is, is in charge of all of the HIV vaccine studies that we're currently running. She's a board certified, in, uh, board certified internist and is completing her specialty training in infectious diseases. She sees patients at Ward 86 at San Francisco General Hospital. I'll introduce Darpin. All right. Um, Thank you everyone for coming out tonight and thank you Ian for that introduction. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the results from HVTN 505 and um, up in front you can actually grab a copy of the recently published um, 505 results um, that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. But I really wanted to just start off in terms of the vaccine regimen that was chosen for 505 and why it was chosen. Um, it was developed specifically to create um, balanced cell-mediated immune responses as well as antibody responses. When we think about the, innate, the immune system, we think about innate and acquired immune, immunity. And a, when we're um, using vaccines, we usually focus on developing an acquired immunity. Here you can see that the acquired immune system includes antibodies and cells. So this vaccine regimen was thought to really create a balanced level of antibodies and cell-mediated immune responses, and that's why it was chosen um, to proceed within this trial. So specifically, this trial focused on um, men who have sex with men and transgender women who, all, who have sex with men primarily because of data from previous trials that suggested that this vaccine was most likely to work in um, this population. Everyone who was enrolled in the trial was known to be AD5 negative, so that means they did not have antibodies to a very common cold virus called adenovirus 5, and they were also circumcised. <coughs> the main questions that were asked as part of this study was, does the vaccine regimen protect from HIV infection? 
the other question was, does this vaccine, vaccine regimen decrease the set point viral load for those who become infected with HIV as part of the trial? And the last piece that's very important to the trial is, is the vaccine regimen safe? So this is a brief schema of the vaccine <laughs> regimen. And I know you're all very familiar with um, what happened during the trial, but just to review, um, at months zero, one, and two, there was a DNA injection given using the biojector that you're all so familiar with. And after month six, and at month six, there was a, the adenoviral boost injection. It was, after, it was four weeks after the boost injection where we were looking at the primary immune response. So that's when there was a really large blood draw and that's where the bulk of all of the um, immune analyses occurred. This um, diagram at the bottom of the slide just demonstrates the parts of the HIV um, structure that were um, included within these vaccines. So on to the details. So HBTN 505 had 21 sites included in it um, that were spread throughout the US, as you can see. Um, at our site, we recruited 191 participants out of the total 2,504 participants. Um, everyone was assi randomly assigned to vaccine or placebo, and it took three years and 10 months to enroll for the study. I wanted to just take a digression here and talk about the regulatory aspects of doing a large clinical trial like this. And all of our, to conduct any of our trials, it's overseen by the FDA. And we also need local institutional review boards to look at our trial protocols. In addition to all of that, there's something called the Independent Data Safety Monitoring Board, also known as the DSMB, which monitors the trial while it is in progress. This is made up of a totally separate group, an independent group of scientists and ethicists who meet regularly to review the safety and efficacy of the study. And they look at unblinded data. So they're the only people who can look at whether or not someone got H the vaccine or the placebo and, and also look at whether or not they were becoming infected or not. So on April 22nd, 2013, which is a date that sort of echoes in our mind, the DSMB met for the first time to look at HIV infection endpoints and decided to just stop the vaccinations in, in HVTN 505 based on futility. So just a word about futility, and there's also a handout on what futility is um, up front, but futility describes that an effort is no, no longer serves a purpose. And in terms of clinical trials, it means that a trial will not be able to answer the question that it sent, set out to explore. So specifically for 505, this meant that the data review showed that there were similar numbers of people who are getting HIV in the active and control groups, and that continuing the vaccinations in the study would not be able to show that the vaccine is effective. Whoa. So um, to, to move further to talk specifically about how well the study um, did overall, this slide um, shows that overall in the study, 94% of individuals who came into the study were vaccinated, and only 4% of participants missed their um, ad 5 boost. And this is like amazing for a study. This is really a tribute to all of you um, and the fact that this trial was able to be conducted with um, such high level of accuracy. Um, in addition, the vaccinations were appropriately received um, between those who were assigned to placebo or to the vaccine. This slide is really busy, but um, it shows the main um, efficacy endpoint, which was whether or not people got HIV who received vaccine or placebo. So just to look at these curves a little bit, um, the red is the people who receive vaccine and the black is people who receive placebo. And what you can see that is, um, is that 27 people who received the vaccine acquired HIV 
versus 21 people who received placebo who acquired HIV. And this is from an analysis that only took people who had received their vaccines and became infected between week 28 after en enrolling in the study up to two years after enrollment in the study. This difference is not statistically significant, meaning that the difference between the, vac the number of people who got vaccine and the number of people who got placebo could be due to chance. Um, another part of this analysis looked at all comers, so anyone who became HIV infected during the course of the study, and that's the modified intent to treat analysis. And here you can see that 41 people that were part of that analysis um, who received vaccine became infected compared to 31 who received placebo who became infected. And this too is not statistically significant, meaning that it could be um, due to chance alone. I think um, an important piece of this, uh, these graphs is that you can't help to notice that toward the end of the graphs that there is a divergence between the placebo and vaccine arm in that it's, there's a greater number of people who receive vaccine who appear to be infected compared to placebo. Um, however, this, these data were from April 22nd and further analyses um, that have not been fully published yet from September demonstrate that these lines actually converge again and that they actually cross back over to um, meaning that there's actually really no difference between those who receive vaccine and those who receive placebo in terms of HIV infection. So this next slide is looking at the the other significant endpoint that was part of the trial, which was for those who became HIV infected, did the vaccine affect set point viral load? And this took an average of all the viral loads between week 10 to week 20 after seroconversion and prior to someone be starting on antiretrovirals. And what you can see is that the dots across the board are all the same, meaning that it didn't matter if you got vaccine or placebo, that did not result in a change in set point viral load. And then this slide is important um, because it looks at the loss to follow up or people who dropped out in the study. And what you can see is that there were actually more people in the placebo group, which is again in black, compared to the vaccine group who dropped out of the study during the course of the trial. Um, the fact that this is statistically significant um, is important for us to, to um, note as we move on in the trial. And it, this, this difference is what we really want to prevent by um, having everybody continue in the trial moving forward. So we can really understand how many people who receive vaccine and how many people receive placebo um, become infected moving forward. Um, and I just wanted to make a note of the um, behavioral risk factors that were found as part of this trial. And this is just signifying two. Um, one which is um, having more than three male partners and the other unprotected receptive anal sex. And basically what is most notable here is that um, from the start of the trial, you can see that in, for both of these risk factors, the, the degree um, to which um, people are reporting these, fact, these risk factors goes down and is also similar um, in the vaccine and placebo arms. We also um, conducted many surveys asking about whether people were using antiretroviral medications to prevent HIV infection or were using um, antiretrovirals after an exposure to HIV, so commonly known as pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP or post-exposure prophylaxis or PEP. Um, and then as you can see here, there's um, relatively low levels of using PrEP or PEP. Um, as of the April 2013 analysis. So in summary, um, these results show that the DNA recombinant AD5 regimen did not prevent against HIV, vac HIV acquisition or affect set point viral load after acquisition. Additionally, um, <coughs> behavioral risks decreased during the course of the trial. We do see that more placebo participants seem to have dropped off during the, during the trial. And um, we also have um, no evidence at all that the vaccine regimen increases the risk of HIV infection. 
So going forward um, within the trial, our real priority is to make sure that we continually continue to um, regularly test participants um, and really f like follow up this trial um, to, to its completion. So um, with that, I really wanted to thank you again. Um, we'll be answering questions um, after uh, Montika's presentation, I think. Is that right? Um, and now I wanted um, to, to really thank um, the 2,504 volunteers who um, gave their time and their bodies um, to uh, allow the testing of this experimental vaccine and um, have really driven forward uh, the agenda and um, our hope in developing an HIV vaccine. So thank you all. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Buckbinder to um, shed some light on future directions in HIV vaccine research. Great. Well, I'm going to add my thanks to all of you for uh, coming out. And please uh, let us, the, the acoustics in here can be a little bit um, unusual. So um, I'm going to try not to stand under the dome, but if you can't hear me, just raise your hand. But nobody ever complains that they can't hear me. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm going to just do a very broad overview of where the HIV vaccine field is. And, you know, are things good? Are things bad? Where, where are we right now? And then we'll get into discussion afterwards. So um, Darpin showed this slide. You know, we used to think of the immune system that we were, okay, so the immune system really has kind of two branches. The innate immune system is the one that actually many animal and plant varieties um, have. It's the first line of defense. It's a fairly crude kind of immune response that's not specific to a, a given pathogen, a given virus or bacteria. It's broader and lots of things can stimulate it to go off. But the thing is, the reason it's the first line of defense is that it's there and it responds pretty much immediately to exposure to foreign agents. The acquired immune response is really the second line of defense. And we've traditionally been thinking our, of ourselves as trying to stimulate this, oh, I don't know what I did there, um, this acquired immune response because this is specific to HIV. And what we're doing with these vaccines is trying to train your immune system as though it's seen HIV uh, so that when it, if it does ever get exposed to HIV, it'll have the antibodies and the cells to kill it off before it establishes infection. So a brief history of vaccine science. Um, initially, we really thought, oops, initially we really thought that antibodies were what were important. And the original vaccines were really designed to build antibodies against the virus. That's how many other vaccines work. That's how the hepatitis B vaccine works. And that's probably why Margaret Heckler in 1985 said we'll have a vaccine available for testing uh, within two years. And we did have a vaccine for testing within two years, but here we are many years later and we still don't have a vaccine that works. Um, and what we found is that the vaccines were generating antibodies, but they were generating antibodies to um, that were not actually neutralizing the virus. It wasn't pre preventing the virus from replicating. So then the, uh, the field moved towards the cellular immune response and said, you know what, we just haven't figured out how to make the antibodies. So we're going to really focus on the cellular immune response. And the STEP study was really, um, a, it was a vaccine trial before this that focused almost exclusively on the cellular immune response. It didn't include any of the outer protein of the, um, the outer coating of the, envelope, um, of the virus, the envelope, and uh, really didn't generate antibodies that we would traditionally think of as protective. And that was not protective. And in fact, there was um, an increased risk in some subgroups of men who were exposed, who got the vaccine, who were um, later exposed to HIV for a period of time 
for about a year after the vaccine was given, they were at somewhat increased risk of becoming HIV infected, and then that went away, which is good news, but it then became clear that really we probably needed both antibodies and cells. And as DARPAN was just saying, the, um, the 505 trial, the HVTN 505 trial, was really focused on generating both antibodies because there's envelope in here, as well as cells that would fight against HIV. Um, now, what we've learned since then, and I'm gonna talk about next, is that we can actually influence the innate immune response as well, and that the innate immune response is probably another integral part of how we're gonna provide protection. And so that's really moved us into a new um, era and a new approach to developing HIV vaccines. So this is a very busy slide, and I'm just gonna walk you through it. Um, basically, this is just about how HIV crosses mucosal barriers, and the mucosa in the cervix, vagina, and foreskin are these flat squamous cells, and in the rectum there are these tall columnar epithelium. But the bottom line is HIV can cross either of these um, barriers and establish infection inside uh, in cells, and particularly in these um, dendritic cells or Langerhans cells. So where do we want the immune response to, to be active and to work? Well, we've got antibodies that basically attach to virus that's not inside of cells. And that's how we've traditionally thought of antibodies, and that could prevent the virus from actually ever passing across the barrier. And so the idea was, or if it does, to clean it up before it actually infects cells. And the idea there was, that's why people were really focused on antibodies to try to prevent infection from actually occurring. Because with HIV, once HIV infection occurs, um, Previously, we would have said it's impossible to eliminate it. Now we've got some examples of HIV being eliminated from people. Um, so that's, again, adding to our knowledge base about how to approach this. Um, the cellular immune response is really about attacking cells that have become um, infected with HIV. And there are both helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells that are part of the acquired immune system. And we were looking for a balance between those two, which is what the HVTN 505 study did. So we had several components in 505. We had antibodies, we had helper T cells, we had cytotoxic T cells. Um, but what we've learned from uh, another study is that we may really need to stimulate this innate immune system as well. So the innate immune system uses antibodies it's got many, many mechanisms. I should just say to any of you who have an immunology background, I'm really sorry that, <laughs> um, that I'm explaining it like this um, because this is very basic and, I, and I'm not an immunologist, but I'm just trying to break it down in as simple a way as I can. Um, but what we learned is that we need that third arm. We think we need that third arm and that there are ways of stimulating this part of the immune system and I'm gonna talk about that next. So we probably need you know, a multi-pronged approach because HIV can get across and we need, we need to, we probably need to both attack it when it's outside of cells as well as when it's infected cells. Oop. So um, I just wanted to make the point that science is about learning new things through observation and experimentation. That's kind of a very rough definition of science. Um, the reason we do these experiments is because we don't know the answer. If we knew the answer, we wouldn't do them. So, but we only take things forward that look promising. But I would say that sometimes we think we know something when we don't, and I'm gonna give you an example of that. This is an article that came out in the um, journal Science in 2004. These are some of the leading HIV researchers who came out saying that we need a sound rationale for phase three or an, a vaccine efficacy trial and that this vaccine trial that had already launched in Thailand was a complete waste of government money, should never have been launched, and was really kind of a travesty. Well, actually, it's the only vaccine that we found that works. So that's why you do science, because you don't know the answer to the question. 
And what you can see here is that this is the, the probability that you become HIV infected. And what you want is you want the line to be as flat as possible because you want, you don't, you want people to stay uninfected. Each time it rises, it means another person has become infected. And in this study of 16,000 volunteers, so it's a huge study, 125 infections. And in fact, there were, this is the, um, this now is the placebo in red, and this is the vaccine. And you can see that the vaccine line is below the placebo line. And so there was a 31% reduction in new infections in this study. And if you look at it after a year, which is when the immune response was strongest, there was like a 60% reduction. So we're, this study has been really critical to our understanding of, the, of immune res responses and what's protective because it looks like it was some combination of the innate immune system, cellular immune response, and humoral immune response, the antibodies, that provided this protection. And so where we are right now is trying to figure out how to build upon this. But this was really a, despite the fact that there was a group of scientists who thought, you know, the, some of the leading basic scientists who said this is a waste of resources, this actually protected people and was the first evidence that we had that we could get a vaccine that would actually protect people. In fact, the vaccine trial that we did before this one, the STEP study, we weren't expecting that we were going to be able to protect people against infection. We'd kind of given up on that. We thought we needed a specific kind of antibody. We couldn't generate that kind of antibody. And so the best we thought we could do would be if people who got vaccinated later became infected, they would be able to control their virus without needing to go on meds immediately. So that's what we were hoping for, turn people into long-term non-progressors who didn't need medication. But this showed that actually we can prevent new infections. So where are we heading? Well, we're trying strategies that are gonna, do, that are gonna generate antibodies, cellular immune response, and innate immunity. Um, with antibodies, we've, we're using these protein-based vaccines but we're also using adjuvants with them that both increase the amount of antibodies but also may stimulate the immune system. We have, and I'm gonna show you a slide next, um, we found antibodies that do neutralize, but they're rare and they're difficult to generate. But we've got some strategies to give people the antibodies themselves. They don't last for very long is the problem, so people might need to come and get regular injections, but we're trying to find ways to make that last and to test whether or not that could protect against infection. You heard about the adenovirus vectors. Well, right now we're testing other vectors, other weakened forms of viruses that don't infect humans but are able to transport the information into the cells because that's what generates a cellular immune response. So this is a picture, a 3D picture. I figure if the basic scientists can do it, I can too. Um, this is the envelope protein, and all of these little purple, blue, whatever color you see them as, um, uh, bumps are actually proteins that, are, are sugars, sorry, that sit on the outside of the, the envelope protein. And they block the antibodies from getting in to stop the virus, um, to attach to it and get rid of it. But there are these pockets inside of these areas that are very conserved, and these are all just names of, of these monoclonal antibodies that have been found to be protective against a wide range of viruses. So these, what we're working on now is trying to develop um, vaccines based on these antibodies. And so I'm just gonna close by going back in time and saying that this was um, the, one of the leading polio researchers in 1945 who said, um, while I was in America, I had good opportunity to meet with most of the men actively engaged in, on research in poliomyelitis because women apparently didn't do anything at that point. <laughs> <laughs> or they didn't count. Um, but um, what they said was, the part played by acquired immunity to poliomyelitis is still completely uncertain and the practical problem of preventing infantile paralysis, which is what they called it, has not been solved. It is even doubtful whether it will ever be solved. 
10 years later, we had the Salk vaccine that was highly effective and was licensed and really put an end to the polio epidemic in many parts of the world. So what I would say is we actually never know how far away we are, but that we are starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel, and it's really as a result of all of the contributions that you have all made to helping us get there. Thanks. So I'm going to introduce Montique Halimi next. Um, Montique has been a research associate and study counselor here on the vaccine team for about two and a half years. She holds her Bachelor of Science in Health and Education and a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from San Francisco State. Uh, called to HIV work by her vision that one day sex will no longer be a social justice issue. She is a co-founder and co-chair of Bridge HIV's Cultural Responsiveness Working Group. In addition to HIV, her interests include transgender health and world languages. Thank you. Thank you. It's really lovely to see everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. It's really lovely to see all of you beautiful, familiar faces. And I just want to spend a couple of moments talking about vaccine-induced seropositivity, which, as Ian mentioned earlier, is the phenomenon in which we detect antibodies in people's blood who've received a vaccine against HIV. And those antibodies, are look, they look exactly the same on a lab test to uh, people who actually have HIV. And so um, people in this group can very easily be misdiagnosed as having HIV if they get tested on standard antibody tests. So um, I want to explain a little bit more about um, what we call VISP here, vaccine-induced seropositivity for short. Um, so these are produced by the vaccine. This, as um, Dr. Buckbinder mentioned, antibodies are one type of immune response that a vaccine can produce in somebody's, um, in somebody's immune system or in their bloodstream. And so um, one really important point about these antibodies is that they can be there even though the vaccine did not work. So in RV144, or the Thailand study, where there was actually some protection, um, those people can, can test positive for antibodies. Um, but other people in other studies, like HVTN505, this study, for example, can also have antibodies, and, um, and that doesn't actually mean that the antibodies are protecting them. They're sort of dummy antibodies, is a way that I like to explain it. And um, also, uh, having these antibodies can complicate an HIV diagnosis, because if um, someone knows that they have antibodies and later does become infected, and we can use another type of test to detect that, that infection, um, it can be hard for that person to believe they've actually become infected and think that no test is good anymore now that their immune system has become so tricky uh, as a result of getting a vaccine. Um, and that's one challenge with these antibodies, um, even if people stick to the advice of just testing inside the study. And another um, difficulty with VISP is that it can change over time. So um, somebody's, uh, somebody can start off in a year after getting injections having a lot of antibodies antibodies, and then a year later, half of those antibodies, and then a year later, they can be gone, and then five years later, they can all come back. Um, and we don't know yet exactly what everybody's antibody patterns will look like from these vaccines in this study until we track that. So that's why, that's one of many reasons why continued follow-up is really important. And this, um, this test over here, these strips, oh, funny how that goes. Um, there we go. These test strips um, are an example of a special type of HIV, uh, HIV test that we can do here called a Western blot. Um, and as you can see, this person who is infected with HIV has a black band at every antibody. That's what these numbers represent. So this person actually has a full virus in their body. But these two examples, like for example here, this person got a vaccine that had just three pieces of HIV in it. And this person's vaccine had just five pieces. And that's why they only have five antibodies there. All right, and I want to talk a little bit about what VISP looked like in HVTN 505. Not everybody who got the vaccines had VISP. Um, it was 58.8% uh, of the participants who got all four injections. And then um, the people who only received the first three, which were the DNA injection that had the biojector, um, only 0 to 14.6% of those people um, have any antibodies. And um, the Western blot results actually looked 
different um, among people who receive the vaccine. There's three different type of um, summary results that can come out of a, a Western blot test. So in other words, when um, a, a doctor looks at these test results here on this Western blot test, there's three different ways that the doctor can interpret it. Um, as you can see over here, um, depending on what antibodies show up, it could be um, it could be seen as negative, meaning the person does not have HIV. It could be seen as indeterminate, which means that it's unsure if the person has HIV. Or lastly, um, it could be misdiagnosed as somebody who's infected with HIV. And about one-fifth of the people who have vaccine-induced antibodies in this study fit into that category as of the one test that we have so far, which we will repeat later. Um, but what this means is that one-fifth of people in this, who receive vaccines in this study could be misdiagnosed um, as having HIV, and it would only be upon getting a viral load test that suspicion might arise in the doctor's mind that this person doesn't actually have HIV. Um, but again, the VISP or the vaccine-induced antibody patterns can change over time, not only because of changes in the immune system, but because of changes in technology. So different type of t HIV tests are um, constantly being developed, and the FDA is constantly approving them, which means we have fantastic new technologies available, um, and it presents some unique challenges for people who have these vaccine-induced antibodies. So I just want to show a couple of examples of how we can interpret these vaccine-induced antibodies. This is what a results page looks like when we get it from the lab. So. Um, some, some people have come in, uh, many of you have come in and gotten one of these um, pages that explains a different type of antibody results. So the first category up here is conventional antibody tests. So this is the most common type of HIV test. If you go and get a finger stick or you get a oral swab at some other clinic, that's what the test is looking for, it's just antibodies. So this person's pattern had um, three different brands here of antibody tests, and you can see that we got three different results there. And then when we did a Western blot, there was, um, it was read as indeterminate. So um, a doctor that received uh, a, a result like this might not know what to do. Um, but thankfully, we use a lab in Seattle that's connected at the headquarters of the HIV Vaccine Trials Network. And um, they add this beautiful summary at the bottom saying this, this result represents vaccine-induced antibodies, and it's not actually an infection. And here's another example, and I just wanted to illustrate this one because unlike the first example, which had a lot of um, different results all on the same page, this person's conventional antibody test came all back reactive and their Western blot was triggered as positive. And so um, since the Western blot is considered a confirmatory test in any clinic, that's the test that will be run to confirm if someone has HIV or not, this person would be misdiagnosed as having HIV. And that person, upon hearing that news, if they first especially if they've forgotten that we told them they may have um, antibodies just from a vaccine, they may go home and be really upset and not come back to get their viral load testing, um, depending on what clinic they're going to. A lot of clinics are adding that in now um, with every blood draw. Um, but this person could, could think that their viral load is probably a million and they might be getting really sick and they might be really scared, um, but really um, all they needed was to come to our clinic and have their viral load tested and there's none detected. So um, these are a couple of really important examples to illustrate why we, um, we absolutely need to continue follow up here at the clinic and we're always going to be a resource for people um, in the study, particularly those of you who've received an experimental vaccine and could have a result like this. We're here at any time um, to support you get you the proper testing that you need and clear up any confusion with outside healthcare providers. So um, with that, I want to thank you for my piece and I'm going to pass it off to Dia Wodi. Um, or we're going to start some quick Q&A, I apologize, um, in tables and Dia Wodi will be picking it up from there. So thank you so much. So the question was, what were the 
a lot of the positivity rates uh, of this. Um, so, yeah, one, two, three, I think we can. Um, so that's a fantastic question. Um, so the number is 58.8%, and um, the reason why it's that number is that if someone has um, a positive ELISA, that's the bottom line of someone having vaccine induced or positive. That's, in other words, that's the meaning of vaccine-induced seropositivity because since the ELISA or the conventional antibody test is the first line of screening tests for HIV, it, we would have to see that first line test come back positive to think that we should ever do additional testing. So if you get a negative ELISA, no additional testing is run on a routine basis. And that's why this number represents ELISA, actually. Does that answer your question? Okay, great question. Is there a certain amount of time or a certain amount of African conventions that can still get a process? Well, we can say is we don't know. And that's one of the reasons that we need to follow people forward over time. And also why we have a registry for anybody who has a positive test result. We have a commitment, that, and the HIV Vaccine Trials Network has a commitment, to have a mechanism to test people <coughs> as long as they need to in the future. And so you can always come back to us um, to be tested, but if you were to move away, we can still make arrangements for you to get a test wherever it is you are. But, and that's what's a little tricky about it, is that the antibodies can come and go. And so um, it, it's, you, you don't necessarily know, that, you know, probably if you have a, a bunch of consistent negative results, it's less likely that you're gonna have antibody in the future. But whenever anybody gets tested, it's really important to tell them that you were part of the vaccine trial, particularly if you got the vaccine, um, because that would help them in interpreting what the antibody results are telling them. Um, but if you come back, I mean, we have had a situation in which somebody became infected. We told them that they were infected. They went to their doctor who said, oh, no, no, it's just the, it's just the vaccine. But it wasn't just the vaccine. They actually truly were infected. That's why it's better for you to come to us because we can help sort that out. Mm -hmm. So um, there's different testing in each of the studies. Um, and again, it's just good for you to let us know, let whomever is doing testing on you know that you're that you were part of a vaccine study. Now, why do you think that a statistically significant number of placebo recipients dropped out of the study? Well, I think we're going to have a discussion with all of you about that to see what your thoughts are about so, it. Weren't they unblind at the time? They were supposed to be blinded at the time, right? So some of this happened early, before the unblinding happened, so that curve that Darwin showed. So what can happen is that people can go out and get tested, and if they had a negative test, assume that they didn't get the vaccine and that they were therefore not important. And what people have to understand is that the only way we can tell what the impact of the vaccine is, is if both groups stay in the study. Um, and the reason that we're having you follow over time is both to see how long the antibody lasts in the positives, but also for two other reasons. One is that we are still teasing out, it's, it's as important for us to know what doesn't work as to know what does work. And the only way we can do that is again to do this comparison between the two groups. The other reason is that in the STEP study, there was an increased risk in a, in a subgroup of people. Now we've done what's called a meta-analysis where we combine data across all of the adenovirus studies. And what was clear is that the vaccine that was used in the STEP study, which was completely different from the vaccine used in this study, did have an increased risk of infection and that the vaccine that was used in this study did not. But we feel it's very important for us to follow, our commitment to you is safety is always our primary consideration. So we need to follow you forward and we will not be able to interpret 
the safety of the vaccine at the placebo group doesn't also stay involved. So we really need everybody to stay involved. Um, and we will be updating you as we have new information. I think what Darwin explained is that the curves were such that the rate of infection was a little bit higher in the vaccine group than the placebo group. And over following just another six months, they crossed back the other way so that the, the infection rate was a little lower in the vaccine group and a little higher in the placebo group. But none of those differences were significant. We think that, you know, there's just, it's kind of like if you flip a coin, sometimes heads is going to be in the lead, sometimes tails is going to be in the lead, but there's no real difference. Um, it's not necessary. it's not a, a coin that's been um, tampered with. <laughs> For the uh, Western blot test, when it shows that they're positive from a disk perspective, and then you do the actual RNA or the, the viral load testing, if it's undetectable, is it quite possible that it is really for the HIV that it's an undetectable viral load? How can you tell the difference between this undetectable using the Western blot and an actual undetectable? The way you can tell is that you're not going to have all of your bands. It's going to be the pattern of bands that are going to be consistent over time. So with this, you never have all the bands. With this, you won't have all the bands. Oh, okay. okay. And but go ahead. Oh, and you, we can also look for DNA, HIV DNA. That's really like the gold standard. Um, and anyone who would be HIV infected would have DNA, even if they didn't have. Because it's true that some people get infected and then their viral load goes down to undetectable on their own. And so that's why, again, you don't want to um, do this on your own. You really want to in engage the, the lab that we have in Seattle that's expert in this. And they have several people who are looking over the test results to make a final determination, which is why you sometimes have to wait forever to get your test results. <laughs> Um, the dropout rate that we experience in the placebo group of the study, is that a sort of standard dropout rate that we were using in other similar studies? Or was that sort of special to this particular study? So actually, we were expecting up to a 10% dropout rate overall. So again, the study was really well done. And, and we, thanks to the participants like coming back, um, we actually saw much lower rates of dropout overall. Um, but unfortunately, we see a little bit of a discrepancy between those who see the placebo and those who see the placebo. So um, ideally, it doesn't. Um, and the, for the reasons Susan mentioned, you know, there could be other things that may have gone on. Um, we can still we can do special analyses called like sensitivity analyses to see if um, the extent to which there's that, that diversion and that could affect the overall outcome in terms of, um, if, say, in the worst case scenario, everyone who dropped out got HIV, or in the worst case scenario, everyone who dropped out didn't get HIV. We could sort of do comparisons to see what is the maximal amount of variation we could get overall in the study results. And they did those analyses, and they found that despite the dropout, that has no effect on um, the vaccine. So those results were for the 25 people. So drop out rates is a consistent consistent data. Um, or is there ever like a occasion for someone to drop out and return back to the study? Or do you collect data oh, and get dropped out? We there. have an open door policy, so anyone who drops out of the study can definitely come back at any time. So, so um, any numbers and, on any returns? So, um, so, and all the data, the way the data is analyzed is in like sort of discrete time points. So um, we look at, we're actually looking at like the amount of time someone contributes to the study as opposed to an individual contributing to the study. So it allows people to come in. Was the dropout rate for um, the placebo group, was that measured against the um, ongoing study? 
so that data has to be revealed. Um, you know, now um, during sort of the, the new version of the protocol, uh, we'll have to see what happens to the dropout rate. But our main concern is really preventing um, any further dropout and trying to really re-enlist people who may have dropped out as well. But those results that you saw were before the unblocking happened. Uh, what are the similarities or differences between the uh, study drugs used in this study and the RD134 study? And did the uh, was there a innate antibody and cellular response to the RD134 study? So, very good question. So the RB144 study is the Thai study that showed protection. And um, that used a canary pox vaccine, which is like um, smallpox, but that affects canaries. But that is a uh, weakened form and doesn't, they actually use it as a veterinary vaccine uh, for birds, but um, it doesn't, it, it, it undergoes an abortive life cycle in um, human cells, so it doesn't continue to replicate. So they use this canary pox vaccine with a protein subunit boost. What the 505 study used was a DNA, pro, a DNA um, vaccine followed by an adenovirus vaccine. So they're <coughs> completely different regimens. Now, I, as I said, I simplified this issue of any humoral, you know, antibody and cellular responses because it's probably it's probably more than just do you have them check or or you know not, uh, but really what kind and what's the balance and what are they specifically targeting on HIV? So what's very interesting about the RB144 study is that they found that. Remember I was showing you at the bottom that combination of antibody with, um, with the cellular immune response, something that we call antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, which is classically part of the innate immune system, uh, but uses part of the acquired immune system to develop, that that seemed to correlate with protection. So the people who got the vaccine and had that response were less likely to get infected than the people who got the vaccine but didn't generate that response. The other thing is that then they looked at the viruses that got, that people did become infected with. And what they found is that that specific area, that specific part of HIV, um, if it matched the virus, if it matched the vaccine, didn't, didn't infect people. So we, we call this kind of sieving. And what it means is if you think about like a colander, you know, for, for pasta, one of my favorite things. Um, you know, basically you're holding the pasta back but some things get through, right? So in sieving, what we're thinking is that the vaccine provides protection as long as there's a match with the vaccine. And hopefully things that are close will also be protected. So what we want is those holes to be as small as possible. But what we, and what we found in the RV144 study was that that ABCC response targeted one specific part of the, of the virus. And that, that particular um, sequence didn't cause infection in the people who got the vaccine. It did in the placebo group, but it didn't in the vaccine. So what we think is that basically it was like a sieve, and it kept those viruses out. But other viruses that were a little bit different from that still get through. So, um, HIV viruses? They're HIV viruses. Like mutated HIV? Yeah, well, it's not even mutation. Yeah, it's, it's not, you know, every time, HIV, I call it a sloppy virus. Every time it replicates, it makes a mistake and it doesn't self correct. So, lots of people, cells, and viral cells correct themselves and they're not so sloppy every time they replicate. But HIV replicates and it's always changing. So again, what we're looking for is, a, is what we're really looking for is a, is a layer of sieves, right? So that anything that gets through the first barrier 
gets caught by the second barrier, and if anything creeps through that, then we've got a third barrier. So that's really what we're working on for vaccine. Um, but it really helped us to believe those results in the Thai vaccine trial, because the very immune response that we saw was the, were the viruses that were sieved out. So that, that gives us hope. Now, unfortunately, it turns out that that region was, was left out of the 505 vaccine. So we think that that may be part of the reason why it didn't work. It was not in that vaccine, because at the time that the vaccine was developed, we didn't know it was going to be an important part of it. The immune response that the Tyler study showed in the first year was fairly high. Would that indicate that that vaccine is going to go forward and be used or would it need to be given on an annual basis? Really great question. Um, that is actually what one of the follow-up studies that's being done is to see if you can continue to boost that response by giving additional doses of vaccine. We don't know how frequently you would need to do it, but could you keep that protection over a longer period of time if you gave boosters? Just like we get our tetanus shots every 10 years, this might need to be done more frequently. Yep, yep. If somebody is in follow-up, continuing to with follow-up at our study, um, we're going to be the most likely to be the ones diagnosing the infection. And in that case, um, we deliver that result with as great care as we can. Uh, bring the participant in person to talk about the result and then um, talk about ways that we can support the participants. So um, that can look like talking with us, that can look like additional visits to come chat. Um, we're going to find out the viral load and, and uh, look at different tests that are going to be helpful for that person's monitoring. Ultimately, though, we're going to be referring participants out to other um, providers who can actually handle a caseload of people um, that need that specialized care. And um, I say will in the hypothetical. I'm hoping that this will not happen with any additional participants. But um, that's the protocol that we would follow. Now, if somebody finds out elsewhere that they've become infected with HIV because they're no longer in follow-up with us, um, anyone that that happens to is welcome to call us. And um, we play, we uh, try to play as active a role as possible in helping each participant in vaccine and placebo to create a plan or risk reduction plan <coughs> to stay um, protected against HIV. And, um, and that's one of our big priorities with the safety of the study. So if that happens to anybody who's no longer in the study, but wants to come back for support around a diagnosis like that, um, we absolutely want to welcome um, welcome that participant, just like we welcome any other participants back into the study um, and, and help connect that participant with additional resources for their health care. Does that answer your question? Okay. Great. So the uh, RD144 was only done in Thailand? Yeah. We did a canary pox uh, vaccine study here. Tell me about it. So <laughs> we, um, we decided not to go forward with that study, even though it was called the HBTN 501 study, and I thought that that was good luck because, you know, because it was named after a pair of jeans, and I thought, you know, it's got to be successful. <laughs> um, and so we had a comparable vaccine that was being tested in North and South America. But because it wasn't generating those cellular immune responses that we were expecting, we said, it's not looking promising, we're not moving it forward. The Thai government and the US HIV military research program decided they were going to move forward even though it wasn't generating that kind of immune response. Um, and they did that for a complex set of reasons. And you heard that there were a bunch of scientists who said that's the wrong thing to do. But that's what science is all about, is getting surprised and then following those leads. Because really what we're trying to do is get to the truth as quickly as possible. So the reason that the DSMB looked early and the reason it was stopped injections is we don't want to inject anybody with a product that's not helpful. Um, and the field needs to know that this was not a, a, a successful approach, that it can move you know, quickly into other approaches and to try to understand this. But it doesn't mean the study is over. We're still following people. It just means that we're not giving any more injections. Thank you. Thank you.
But um, in the RV one, we, we were testing a similar product but decided not to go forward with it. Um, wrong decision. Um, <coughs> I'm trying to understand the, the RV144 study as opposed to our study. Um, would those numbers at all be skewed because not only is it probably a predominantly Asian culture, a Thai Asian culture, which genetics get involved with that as well as opposed to the study here where we're much more broadly ethically blended and mixed. And Great question. So there are a number of reasons why it might have worked there. And so there, there is a new version of that vaccine is being formulated for Africa because the African epidemic is where the majority of new infections are happening globally. The HIV infection rate is much higher. So the HIV infection rate, uh, you saw there were 125 infections, but they had enrolled 16,000 people. And that's because the infection rate was like uh, less than 1% per year. It was something like four tenths of 1% per year, which is great. It, it's because the whole Thai epidemic has really turned around. Um, but what we don't know is, will a vaccine work if people are being more heavily exposed? Will it work against a different strain of virus? So there are families of HIV. In Thailand, they have a, um, an a, a plate A-E combination. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it's plate C. And in North and South America, it's plate B, predominantly. I mean, there's some differences in different places. So we don't know if we're going to need to have matched vaccines in the different regions. So it's being tested again in a couple of places. The plans are to retest in Thailand, but now in men with sex with men and transgender uh, women and men with sex with men. And the reason for that is that, again, we don't know. Maybe it protects uh, uh, vaginally, but not rectally. And we don't have great behavioral data on the Thai and the Thai population. And talking about sex is not culturally um, appropriate in some situations. And so we don't know how much anal sex was going on. But um, we know that there was also vaginal acquisition. So we don't know if, if we're going to need different things based on the route of transmission. So it's going to be tested in Thai, um, men of sex with men, and trans men and women. Um, and then it's going to be tested, a different version of it is going to be tested in uh, South Africa in uh, men and women. Um, so this question may be not a long time, but uh, given the way that we administer vaccinations in the U.S., and for example, keep in mind fully, uh, which I would say is eradicated in the U.S., uh, what level of drug efficacy would be needed in order to eradicate HIV? Great question. So um, we're really taking a multi-pronged approach to um, eradicating the HIV epidemic. And the, the components are, how do we prevent new infections, and how do we keep more infected healthy, um, and also not transmitting new, new virus. So that's, that's our goal. Um, we could have an impact on the epidemic with even a modestly effective vaccine. <coughs> You know, what people have said is, you know, 50%, could it be probably not 30%, but what we've got now is we have pre-exposure prophylaxis that hopefully you all know about that's um, using an anti-HIV medication to prevent HIV infection if you take it on a daily basis. So we know that that works for some people. And if we could use a vaccine and prep, and we're testing a rectal microbicide now, um, which is a gel that uses an anti-HIV medication, but it's, it's applied topically, so it's like a loop. Um, we think we, we're going to need multiple things in order to eradicate the epidemic. It's not going to be quite like polio was, because we're not at a point where, you know, the polio vaccine was very, very highly efficacious. 
what we're talking about here is trying to build on efficacy. It's kind of like, I have a slide that I sometimes show about childhood leukemia, where the, the five-year survival rate was less than 50% um, in the middle of the last century, and it just slowly, slowly increased so that it's now almost 90% survival for five years for kids who get leukemia. And that's because they figured out how to stop it a bit, and then they kept improving on it incrementally. And that's what we're doing here. But we're nowhere near the 90% efficacy that might be required to really uh, substantially drive down the epidemic. But we think that even if we had a 50 or 60% vaccine, we'd drive down new infections. So I think we have time for one more question. And then, um, of course, after working the around, stop us. So what if, I'm wondering if you're thinking about CCR5. So one of, there are some people, there are genetic factors that protect against infection. And there are people who have this gene that is used as a, it creates a protein that's used as the receptor for, by which HIV gets into the cells. People who have a mutation in that gene and have that same mutation in both copies of their gene are very unlikely to become infected. Now the problem is we've seen two people here in San Francisco who become infected despite having two copies of that deficient gene because they got infected with a more virulent form of HIV that uses a different receptor. Mm -hmm. So it's not absolute. But as I said, there's a lot of work being done on cure. And at the same time that there's a lot of work being done in prevention, and we're really trying to learn across <coughs> the treatment and prevention divide to see what, what will help move most fields forward. Thank you so much. Thank you.